Good morning. In today's headlines, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky met with a mixed reception in Washington. We have reactions to the visit. Border towns buckling under the strain of illegal immigration. The Democratic mayor of Eagle Pass, Texas, is calling on the Biden administration to enforce the law. Ten times worse. A consultant tells us the result of Oregon's decriminalization of drugs and hear about his terrifying experience when he went on the streets to help out. A $7.5 trillion spending spree in Washington has contributed to inflation. That's what a report finds. We hear from the author on how to remedy this. New rules in the making. The White House is set to propose removing medical bills from consumer credit reports. What are the pros and cons? Ancient calligraphy, seal carving, and everything in nature. In the eyes of a Miss NTD beauty pageant candidate, all of them inspire beauty. We have her story. Good morning, all. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning. I'm Evelyn Lee. Today is Friday, finally, September 22nd. Yes, and it's great that we get to meet the Miss NTD candidates before the big day, September 30th. Absolutely. And might I just say seal carving? I don't think I've met anybody that does that before. That's exciting. I'm curious to learn about it. And to quote our CEO, outer beauty attracts, but inner beauty captivates. Mm, There you go. But first... We have some more serious news to get to, but stay tuned for that one for sure. First, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky received a mixed reception during his visit to Washington yesterday. He met with President Biden at the White House, military leaders at the Pentagon, and lawmakers on Capitol Hill. Overall, Zelensky received bipartisan support, although House Speaker Kevin McCarthy declined Zelensky's request for a joint session of Congress. He said there was no time on such short notice, alluding to negotiations for funding to avoid a possible government shutdown at the end of the month. McCarthy chose not to join House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries in greeting Zelensky when he arrived at the Capitol and instead opted for a meeting behind closed doors. Zelensky is now in Canada and will address the Canadian Parliament today in Ottawa, where he'll continue his efforts to shore up support. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more on Zelensky's visit and lawmakers' reactions. President Biden announced a new military aid package for Ukraine worth $325 million on Zelensky's Thursday visit and vowed continued U.S. support. And next week, the first U.S. Abrams tanks will be delivered to Ukraine. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the presidential drawdown assistance package includes significant air defense capabilities but that the U.S. will not be providing long-range Army tactical missile systems that Zelensky is requesting, at least for now. These capabilities will help Ukraine harden its defenses ahead of what is likely to be a tough winter. The U.S. has appropriated $113 billion in military, economic, and humanitarian aid to Ukraine and countries affected by the war since it began. Sullivan says those funds will soon run dry and is asking Congress for additional resources on October 1st. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy called his meeting with Zelensky direct and productive. We're very concerned about accountability. Biden has asked Congress for more than $24 billion for Ukraine's support. McCarthy says he's willing to look at it, but thinks more of the president's focus should be on the southern border. Right now, the CR we have does not have that. We also have a lot of disasters in America. Zelensky also attended an all-senators meeting. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says the effects of a government shutdown or to pass a continuing resolution with no aid would be devastating for Ukraine. Without aid, Ukraine could run the very strong risk of being defeated. Thank you. Senator Josh Hawley says his position on Ukraine remains the same. Let's not forget, Russia is a problem for us, but China is our number one foreign policy threat. Number one. The Pentagon has determined its Ukraine operations exempt from a potential government shutdown. Defense Department spokesman Chris Sherwood said Thursday that Operation Atlantic Resolve was established in 2014 following the Russian invasion of Crimea and is meant to support Ukraine and bolster NATO's eastern flank. The Pentagon says Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin provided Zelensky an update on security assistance during his visit and reaffirmed support. We're going to continue to work very hard with Ukraine and our international allies and partners to ensure they have what they need to be successful on the battlefield. Zelensky thanked the U.S. for its military assistance and support at his speech at the National Archives. There is not a soul in Ukraine that does not feel gratitude to you 
America. To you, the people who help us, not because, because you have to, but because your heart cannot let you do otherwise. The Ukrainian leader says America's investment in Ukraine is security and global protection of freedom. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The Department of Justice has arrested a government contractor and charged him with spying. The man, originally from Ethiopia, allegedly took advantage of his top-secret security clearance. Abram Teklu Lemma had access to classified information from his employment with both the State Department and the DOJ. Court documents don't mention the country implicated in the espionage, but the New York Times identified it as Ethiopia. According to court documents, he allegedly used an encrypted messaging application to transmit maps, photographs, and satellite imagery. Prosecutors say he accessed dozens of intelligence reports, copying information and downloading it to CDs and DVDs. Lemma now faces charges of retaining and delivering national defense information to aid a foreign government and conspiring to do so. The State Department learned about the espionage during an internal 60-day security review. It was prompted by the arrest of the Air National Guardsman accused of leaking classified military documents on a social media platform. A federal shutdown is looming, yet a few House Republicans are against discussing a defense funding bill. NTD's Arlene Richards tells us why and how the Speaker of the House is reacting. The House GOP Thursday again fails to pass a procedural vote, also called a rules vote. The final vote, 216 to 212. It means the House won't discuss a bill to fund the Pentagon for the next fiscal year which could help to prevent a looming government shutdown. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy blames the stalemate on five Republican holdouts. Well, if they don't want to even vote to allow us to bring the bills up, how does anybody complain you haven't brought all the bills up? I mean, um, it, it, it's, it's frustrating in the sense that I don't understand why anybody votes against bringing the idea and having the debate. And then you got all the amendments if you don't like the bill. This is a whole new concept of individuals that just want to burn the whole place down. It, it doesn't work. The five holdouts include Andy Biggs of Arizona and Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia. Biggs said, shut it down. At what point are we going to stand up and say no? Yeah. We're, we're not going to keep funding the government that's, that's attacking the American people. Right. I've been here long enough to have heard five-year plans, ten-year plans, and it, none of this ever gets changed. Yeah. Green said in a social media post that she voted no because they refused to take the war money from Ukraine out and put it in a separate bill. McCarthy, who supports giving weapons to Ukraine, met Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky on Thursday. The speaker didn't commit to new aid to Ukraine. I raised issues with them, seeing we're very concerned about accountability. Now, you've got to understand when we provide resources, we don't send cash, we send our weapons. And then we, when we vote for more um, monetary money, it's to rebuild the supply chain and the weapons for America. Meanwhile, a federal shutdown is looming. The federal government will shut down at midnight September 30th, unless Congress passes legislation to renew funding. But government operations wouldn't come to a complete halt as contingency plans do exist for critical services like border security and federal law enforcement. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley said the House has a job to do. Get in the room and figure it out, but do not play games with the American people or the taxpayers. It's unclear when Republicans may try the vote again. Arlene Richards, NTD News. The Biden administration is facing backlash as a recent surge in illegal immigrants floods into border towns. And today's Daniel Monahan brings us more on the worsening crisis. Thousands of illegal immigrants have crossed into the United States in recent days, and more are still arriving by bus and cargo train to Mexican border towns. The administration had promised to carry out harsh penalties for illegal crossers in May, but experts say the U.S. lacks the capacity to detain and process them. As a result, some are being released into the U.S. with a future court date instead of being deported. One of the worst hit towns is Eagle Pass, Texas. The border town announced a state of emergency on Wednesday. This after nearly 6,000 illegal immigrants crossed the Rio Grande River in two days. Eagle Pass Mayor Rolando Salinas told CNN, 
No one in the Biden administration has bothered to contact them about the crisis. We're here abandoned. We're on the border. We're asking for help. This is unacceptable. Please just enforce the laws that are on the books. Salina says the cops in Eagle Pass are overwhelmed and that there have been robberies and that illegal immigrants have broken into homes. The director of migrant services in Tijuana sees the potential for a humanitarian crisis. Irregular border crossings are being encouraged, generating organized crime and human trafficking. These are the risks we see if decisions are not taken promptly. This Venezuelan migrant says he prefers possible death on the road and a chance at life to dying by hunger in his crisis-struck homeland. We hear rumors they are letting people into the United States. Our idea is to get there always accompanied by God. The crisis is also hitting towns in their pocketbooks. Eagle Pass was forced to close one of the city's two international bridges and a rail bridge. Mayor Salinas says 60 percent of the city's budget depends on tolls from those crossing. Southern states aren't in the quagmire alone. Cities like New York and Chicago are also grappling with record numbers of new arrivals. The Windy City recently awarded a private security company a contract worth $30 million. The task? Moving the migrants out of police stations and airports into giant tents in two winterized camps before the winter freeze arrives. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Still to come, we have more on the current immigration crisis as we bring in a retired ICE agent who was just at the border. And overdose deaths in Oregon are spiking. That's after the state decriminalized drugs. A consultant tells us addicts want to get clean, but they don't know how, and he has a solution. That's after the break. Hi, I'm Ken Mears for Omega XL, the natural joint health supplement sourced from the green lip muscles of the pristine waters of New Zealand. Omega XL can help you with pain caused by inflammation. There's a reason that millions of people have been taking Omega XL. It's because Omega XL delivers results you can feel. With a unique combination of over 30 fatty acids found only in the oil extract of the green lip muscle, Omega XL has been providing relief to inflammation pain for nearly 20 years. If you have pain in your back, neck, knees, or elbows, try Omega XL and get a second chance at life. Before Omega XL, I was in a lot of pain. I felt like this is a miracle for me and my life. I love to run and play with my grandkids, and now I can do that again, all because of Omega XL. You don't have to put up with pain. Think about what you would be doing playing with your grandchildren, meeting with friends, or even just feeling comfortable enough to get through your day. Since I have started Omega XL, I didn't think it was possible to, to take one supplement and have that great uh, re response. Thank you, Omega XL. I'm very happy to be able to continue doing what I do. You can get back to living the life you want, and inflammation is manageable, it's controllable, and it's fixable. Go to OmegaXL.com or call the number at the bottom of your screen right now for our new offer. Buy one bottle of Omega XL, get one free. That's two bottles for only $39.95. Plus, you'll also receive a bottle of Vitamin XL D3 absolutely free. That's two bottles of Omega XL plus Vitamin XL D3, a value of more than $107. But when you call today, you pay only $39.95 on your first order. Try Omega XL and see the difference it can make in your life. Call now. I use Book a Limo on all my trips. They have drivers everywhere. I always feel safe when I travel with their chauffeurs, from hello to goodbye. Checking rates, booking, and managing clients' reservations online is so easy. The confirmations, trip reminders, and car status updates are great when I'm on the go. I want my clients to have the best experience during their trip. That's why I've used Book a Limo for the past 30 years. What's your destination? Book a Limo, any car, anywhere. Hey Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Dad? 
see stars? This is their friends. Look! Good to have you back and we're continuing with the border. Border crossings are reaching near record levels. The first 20 days of September saw an average of around 6,900 migrants crossing a day. So what's behind the surge and what's happening at the border now? We're bringing in Victor Avila. He is a retired special agent with ISIS Homeland Security Investigations. Good morning, Victor. It's really good to have you now. To start, Texas just declared a state of emergency and you just came back from the border. So what is the situation there right now? What did you see? My goodness, it's uh, chaotic. You know, every day, I, 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 every time I go down there, I think it's not going to get worse. And it is really, really bad situation right now. Obviously, it's the surge of numbers from Eagle Pass, Texas, that you've been talking about, but also in El Paso, Texas, where the capacity there in the facility holds 2,400 migrants. It is over 5,000 now. And I spoke directly to a lot of Border Patrol agents who tell me what is causing, just to your question, what is causing this surge? And they think it's a number of factors. One is that they're knowing uh, the, the migrants and people from all over the world are understanding and the word is out that there is no consequences for them to come into the country illegally. As a matter of fact, they know that they will be taken care of in certain cities in the United States. Another po possible factor is that the word got out that there might be a possible government shutdown because uh, there's a group of Republicans that want uh, border security as part of the continued resolution. So that might be a factor. They think that it might shut down. So you see a surge of all of them coming at once. That's a very interesting point there. And uh, before we get into that, tell me more about what is happening in the city of El Paso then when you say it's chaotic. How are how are the people there managing, you know, with um, managing the influx of people and also, you know, taking care of them? Uh, let me tell you, I, I had a, a lengthy conversation of, of uh, the actual uh, logistics of what Border Patrol does with the migrants. And it is because of the surge of numbers, several things are happening here and it gets a little complicated, but I'll break it down for you. Um, they're, they're over capacity, so they're releasing uh, a lot of the illegals to the streets. Uh, they don't want to call it that. They, they want to call it something else because they don't want to alert the public that they're actually going. But if you go down to downtown El Paso in the plaza, a real nice historic plaza, they are now sleeping, sleeping on the streets. And so the, the Border Patrol, what they do is they pass on the, the migrants to the next phase. And that could be to the city of El Paso, the county of El Paso, the non-governmental organizations that now will have to take over. And so the city and county of El Paso, in this case, is having to open their own facilities to hold them until the migrants get the transportation, either be on a bus or an airplane, to make it to their final destination. Wow, and of course, <clears throat> there is um, these concerns about then the vulnerabilities with, that come with that, right, when they sleep outside and the like, human traffickers and things like that. So you were talking to those migrants as well, right? What do they tell you? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, the, I can tell you that there, I never heard the word asylum. And uh, I know uh, they, they like to call them asylum seekers. I don't believe that that's what they are. I, I believe that most of them are migrant, uh, uh, um, you know, people coming here for a job. But I, I also see, and it's important to point out, the crime. There's a lot of crime that's being committed from, by a lot of these individuals. I understand not all of them, but there is a lot of crime. The, there is a lot of fentanyl. Uh, methamphetamine being pushed by them. There's, uh, you mentioned the human trafficking, something that I investigated in my career. Uh, and so a lot of them are not wanting to assimilate here to the United States and follow our laws. And so you see a lot of crimes. And I want to point out, that we've had several. One uh, that came in through Eagle Pass, Texas earlier this year uh, was arrested for murder, for uh, murdering a man in Eagle Pass. We had a drowning of a toddler yesterday in Eagle Pass, Texas, there in the river. So a lot of death and a lot of chaos is still continuing to happen. And the, one of the best ways you do and uh, to prevent any of this is to actually secure the border. Right, and it's heartbreaking with them that this all is happening. At the same time, what you mentioned, the drugs, the fentanyl. So talk to me about, there's uh, recent reports about cartels also encouraging crossing. So tell me more about the role that you see them playing here. 
My goodness, it's the, probably one of the major roles. The, the, they are, the cartels are being emboldened. They're making billions of dollars, not only on the drugs that continue to pour in. And let me tell you, I was talking to Border Patrol, and they, are, they, they say we don't know any idea how much of those drugs are actually coming in. We only know what we catch, and that's a very small percentage. But the cartels are, are making billions with the movement of humans as well on the smuggling side to get into the country. And of course, on the exploitation side, uh, on human trafficking, uh, I'm on my way uh, to Washington, D.C. later today to attend the uh, Lost of Vo uh, the Lost Voices of Fentanyl March. And these are uh, to support the families that have lost a loved one. Uh, to a counterfeit fentanyl pill that is directly related to the cartels, related to China in Mexico that continues to give them the precursors and chemicals. And this is a real issue. We have hundreds of thousands of people dying in our country with these fake pills. And uh, I don't see anybody doing about it. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm running for Congress to, to change it. Right. Well, thank you so much for your insights today it's concerning and stories that really give you goosebumps. Thank you, Victor Avila. I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. And we are going to New York. Officials are probing the cause of a bus crash that killed two adults and injured dozens of students yesterday. At least five children were in critical condition as of last night. I heard him was screaming and then I got it. So I, I thought it was a dream until I felt like the pain in my leg. He landed on the side. I had to like, jump out the window. The bus was carrying 40 high school band members and four adults. It was one of six in a convoy heading to a band camp in Pennsylvania. It ran off the highway and tumbled down a steep ravine. The National Transportation Safety Board and New York State Police are investigating. A team is expected to arrive at the scene of the crash this morning. That's on Interstate 84 near the town of Wawayanda, about 70 miles northwest of New York City. While it's preliminary, it is likely that a faulty front tire contributed to the accident. Although, again, this is still under investigation. Those are, that's a preliminary determination. The school district says the other five buses turned back after the crash and offered students the chance to meet with grief counselors on the way home. More drugs were found at the New York City daycare center, where a one-year-old died and several other children were hospitalized last week. All the children were exposed to opioids. Investigators discovered a hidden compartment under the floor in what was the children's play area after a new search warrant was issued. The NYPD announced yesterday they discovered fentanyl among the 22 pounds of different drugs found in the compartment. Police also discovered drug paraphernalia in the same area. A previous search uncovered over two pounds of fentanyl stored on top of play mats used by children. The owner of the daycare and her husband's cousin, who rents a room at the property, were both arrested. They were charged in state court with murder of depraved indifference. Both denied knowledge of and involvement in any illegal drug operation. Authorities are looking for a third suspect who is believed to be the owner's husband. The suspect was last seen on the day the children died, carrying two full shopping bags through a back alley outside the property. Both defendants opted not to testify before a grand jury. Their next court date is scheduled for October 5th. And, you know, something to point out here, Evelyn, is that the lethal dose of fentanyl is about the size of a few grains of salt. So you wonder if the residue from that is enough to harm children. Exactly. We're going to go over to Oregon now. Finally, some hindsight into how decriminalizing drugs impact communities. Let's see how the area is faring. Joining me now is Kevin Dahlgren, a homelessness consultant in Oregon who runs the truthonthestreets.org website. Kevin, it's great to hear from you today. Great to be here. Thank you. How did decriminalizing drugs in Oregon play out? <laughs> well, it's made things 10 times worse. I mean, this has become a public health crisis. Uh, I do homeless street outreach in Portland every day. I have never seen more bodies. We have a record number of overdoses and deaths. The whole point of decriminalization of drugs was to prevent overdoses and deaths, and it's done the exact opposite effect. So it's become, it's terrifying to even go downtown Portland these days. Uh, you know, uh, every day I go down there, the homeless will let me know about a new person who had died. And the reason why this failed was what they 
failed to do, one of their promises was we were going to build detox and treatment and recovery programs. Well, that took two full years, and only just a couple of weeks ago did they open up their very first facility, which is 16 beds. But in that two-year period, we've seen, again, this record number of overdoses and deaths. So it's an absolute tragedy what's, uh, what's occurring on our streets. And that record number of overdose deaths is also accompanied yeah. by the highest percentage of adults with a substance abuse disorder. So what can we do here to improve public health going forward? Wow. Well, I mean, at this point, this has become about enforcement. I mean, we've seen a, a big spike in crime on the streets, too. And what we need is more police. Because right now, uh, what I'm finding is that most homeless now carry guns. It's very normal for them to have a knife, but guns is this new behavior because there's this desperation attached to fentanyl, and people are getting desperate for their next pills. And so I'm seeing more and more guns out there. So something something is about to happen, and it's pretty terrifying out there. And I don't feel safe. I personally had a gun pulled on me a couple weeks ago unexpectedly because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time where there was a bad deal going on. I was in between two homeless people fighting, and they had guns. And I'm like, wow, I'm about to die. And they were serious, so that was sketchy. So, Kevin, really, I'm sorry that need... happened to you, yeah. first of all. Yeah, thank that you. It shouldn't it's, happen it's... to anyone. And it, it's no, just public it health shouldn't. mismanagement is now spilling over into public safety. Yeah, exactly. You know, people now avoid downtown Portland because of things like this. It's just dangerous. It's just simply dangerous to be down there. So despite the, uh, you know, you have the tragedy of the people overdosing and dying, but you also just have the, the uptick in crime. So, I mean, it's just not the place to be. And now so, it's even uh, spilling it, into these economic ramifications. Now, so do you say that if you jail people, it's not going to help stop this substance abuse disorder, but clearly this path is not working. So can you explain the step-by-step process where someone gets a dedic- an addiction, they either go into jail or not, and how that plays out? Well, what we really don't have in our community is uh, good outreach and good treatment. You know, like a lot of the addicts I work with said, look, I'm open to changing. I want to get clean, but I don't know how. And so they're brutally honest with me and they're saying, we do want the help, but we're not getting it. So we just continue to use and do our thing. So that's going to be step one is uh, outreach teams going out there and working with these individuals every day and be like, all right, let's fix this. It's, a, it's really a tragedy. There needs to be some enforcement there. Kevin Dahlgren, homelessness yeah. consultant in Oregon, thank you. Thank you. It's a good interview with him. He, yeah. You know, he makes a lot of good points, and hopefully they can get that outreach because fentanyl is such an addictive substance. Well, exactly, and the most heartbreaking, really, when he says is we want to get clean, but we just don't know how. So, yeah, good that there is the help out there now. Yes. And we're heading now to uh, Malcolm Hudson in the UK for some short headlines around the world. Good morning from the UK, Evelyn and Kevin. Polish President Andrzej Duda said yesterday that the words of Polish Prime Minister about arms supplies to Ukraine were interpreted in the worst possible way. Duda refers to Prime Minister's words that Poland is no longer arming Ukraine and is focusing on rebuilding its own weapon stocks. He said it was meant in the context of the new arms supplies the country buys for its own army. A court in Indonesia has convicted a woman of inciting religious hatred. They sentenced her to two years in prison for saying a Muslim prayer and then eating pork in a TikTok video. Under blasphemy charges, Lina Luftiawati was also ordered to pay a fine of over $16,000. Consuming pork is considered haram or forbidden in Islam. More than 300 people were killed and over 600 wounded by cluster munitions in Ukraine in 2022. According to an international watchdog, this means Ukraine is the country that's had the highest number of casualties from cluster munitions, even surpassing Syria. Cluster bombs are a controversial weapon that release scores of smaller bomblets, which continue to kill dozens of people every year. Drivers found an exhausted and malnourished lion cub on the side of the road in northern Serbia yesterday morning. It was taken to a zoo and was receiving treatment and infusion to improve its condition. The smuggling of wild and rare animals is believed to be widespread in the Balkan region. That's all from me. Back to you both. Coming up, controversy surrounds a new White House office for gun control before it even officially opens. 
and extended strike action by the United Auto Workers could have devastating effects on the economy. Will automakers and the union reach an agreement by today's deadline? New rules in the making. The Biden administration seeks to remove medical debt from consumer credit reports. What are the pros and cons? NTD business host Don Ma breaks this down for us in just a minute. I use Book a Limo on all my trips. They have drivers everywhere. I always feel safe when I travel with their chauffeurs, from hello to goodbye. Checking rates, booking, and managing clients' reservations online is so easy. The confirmations, trip reminders, and car status updates are great when I'm on the go. I want my clients to have the best experience during their trip. That's why I've used Book a Limo for the past 30 years. What's your destination? Book a Limo, any car, anywhere. Tired of scrolling Netflix? Trying to find something that's worth watching? Want to skip the censorship in mainstream media? Well, now you can with Epic TV. New exclusive content every day with over a hundred never before seen movies, films, and documentaries. Available and streaming now at your fingertips. For a limited time now, you can get 60% off Epic TV by subscribing or upgrading to a yearly plan. Plus, get an additional $10 credit to rent featured movies on Epic Cinema today. Skip mainstream narratives and find quality family entertainment from the comfort of your very own home. Say no to big tech and subscribe to Epic TV. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. Pre-diabetes does. One in three adults has pre-diabetes, but with early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. And you can change the outcome. Take the one minute pre-diabetes risk test today. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org. Good to have you back. The deadline for Detroit's big three automakers to reach an agreement with the UAW is today at noon. So far, no agreement has been reached, fueling concerns over implications to the industry and the economy. Workers are demanding an end to a tiered wage structure, a 40% pay increase, and better benefits. The three automakers proposed 20% raises over four and a half years. The Biden administration has shown support for the strikes, saying strike action should go further until demands are met. Meanwhile, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott has come under fire for criticizing the strike, saying striking workers should be fired. A report by the Heritage Foundation found the government added $7.5 trillion to the national debt over the last two years, contributing to inflation. We hear from an author of the report on what the main takeaways are. Richard Stern, director, of the, her, uh, director at the Heritage Foundation, joins us now. Thank you so much for your time, Richard. What are the main takeaways of this report here? Well, thank you for having me on today. I think the main takeaway of this report is that the government wantonly just added trillion after trillion dollars of spending, amounting to seven and a half trillion dollars of needless spending during a two-year period of time. And how was almost all of that money paid for? With the Federal Reserve just printing the money. And that is like pouring water into the wine of everyone's life savings. That drove the inflation. It's driving the interest rate uh, uh, crunch now so that mortgages are unaffordable and that home ownership is a distant dream for most Americans. This is the main cause of that problem. We're seeing a slower, worse recovery because of the choices the government made during the pandemic, which had almost no effect on the economy during the pandemic. It's interesting you say that because the left-leaning Center on Budget and Policy Priorities says that without the COVID relief, there would be a slower recovery, unemployment would have been higher for longer, and there would have been more evictions and food insecurity. What's your reaction to this? Yeah, so this is the, the normal leftist trope, which is that money is best in the hands of the federal government and federal bureaucrats. But you, know, you got to dig into what they're talking about here, right? What is money really? It's a representation of actual goods and services. You can't eat a dollar bill. 
I mean, you can, but I wouldn't encourage you doing it. You can't really live inside of a dollar bill. You can't wear a dollar bill. You use money to buy goods and services. So if there aren't real goods and services produced, the money is worthless. It can't be redeemed for something, and that's what inflation is a representation of. When there's more money in the system, but not more goods and services. So what, what are the left talking about here? They're saying that magically, when there's a pandemic, so there's a real loss of production because of interruptions in supply chains, that the right thing to do is steal from people during the pandemic so the government can slosh the dollars around because that will magically mean that there's more goods and services. It fails on its head the minute you start digging into their, their liberal ideologies. It's an interesting note you point out there on monetary policy. Richard, there, along these lines, there are some that say that 10% of that COVID relief money was either stolen by fraudsters or misspent and that there were still funds remaining in that first round when they started passing the second round, increased the labor shortage by paying people not to work. Back to your report, what new programs were created by both parties after the COVID outbreak and are they fiscally responsible? I, no, it's a good question. So there are hundreds of individual programs that were created and it ranges from a $350 billion slush fund just to state and local governments to PPP programs that actually a lot of the fraud was in that went to businesses, a lot of whom didn't need the money or were already dead and were fraudulent companies. There's actually the employee retention credit, which surprisingly is still a program companies are filing to get benefits from. Clearly nobody needs benefits today to help their business survive the pandemic that happened almost four years ago. So, you know, there's a plethora of programs like that and, and exactly what you're talking about. A lot of them paid people to get out of the workforce, to not work whatsoever, to let their skills atrophy. So a lot of these programs have expired. Like I said, the ERC, it's still around today. So, you know, we're still looking at the legacy of this, both in terms of the inflation, in terms of the bloat to the federal debt. But uh, some of these programs are around in the sense that congressmen want to bring them back and are talking about the value of permanent subsidies, the companies. Again, those are subsidies that come at the expense of having been stolen from hardworking families that actually earn that money in the first place. So this is the pressure we're looking at today. For better or for worse, those programs were in, in the works. So what is the solution to the economic damage that you attribute to this spending? Absolutely, the solution is to cut government spending. You know, at the end of the day, and like I said, it's real hardworking Americans that actually produce all of the goods and services we have. When the government goes in the debt, when it prints money, what it's doing is putting artificial demand what I mean is it's creating demand for goods and services without having produced any goods and services whatsoever. My, my joke is there's only two people that can get money without producing value for somebody else, and it's criminals and the federal government. So as long as the government is willing to spend so much money and run such large deficits that it'll drive this inflation, there is no way out from under it. The Fed can move it between an interest rate crisis and an inflation crisis, but you can't get rid of it. There's only one solution to cut government spending. A lot of debate out of this, and thank you for working so hard on that 46-page report, 175 references. Richard Stern, the director of the Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget at the Heritage Foundation, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. A California law violates the right to free speech, apparently. An appeals court ruled yesterday that California's ban on certain gun advertisements to minors is unconstitutional. Judge Kenneth Lee said there is no evidence that a minor in California has ever unlawfully bought a gun, let alone because of an ad. The ruling reversed a lower court order aimed at restricting the sales of firearms to minors. While the law is meant to prevent gun advertisers from reaching minors, the new ruling noted that it included speech directed at adults who are able to lawfully purchase firearms. California Governor Gavin Newsom signed the law last year in response to the Uvalde school shooting in Texas. We zoom out from gun control issues in California to a new national initiative being spearheaded by the White House. The new office is already creating lots of controversy before it even becomes official. President Biden will announce the creation of a White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention later today. The move is evoking strong reactions from supporters and detractors. Second Amendment supporters say gun control advocates are now on the White House payroll. Alan Gottlieb of the Second Amendment Foundation called the move un-American and in direct opposition to the Bill of Rights. 
David Hogg is a founder of March for Our Lives and a survivor of the 2018 school shooting in Parkland, Florida. In his words, celebrate this win. It shows the difference politics can make. Vice President Harris will oversee the office, and White House Assistant to the President Stephanie Feldman will serve as its new director. Millions of Americans with unpaid medical bills would no longer have that debt show up on credit reports under proposals from the Biden administration. Here to discuss is Entity Business host Don Ma. Good to see you, Don. As usual, tell us more about this new proposal. Yeah, so this new rule from the White House, you know, if finalized, then consumer credit companies would not be allowed to put medical debt and collection information on reports used to make underwriting decisions. Um, so to put it simply, reports that help decide whether you get a loan or not will not show medical debt information. Um, lenders uh, will only be able to consider non-medical information when looking at your loan applications. And as well, uh, debt collectors can't use your medical debt on your credit report you know, to force you into paying uh, questionable bills. So the proposal is being considered by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and the agency is solicit soliciting feedback from uh, small businesses that may be affected, and the Bureau expects to uh, issue a proposal, proposed rule next year. Oh, wow. So I, when we actually break it down onto Americans, what does this mean for them on a practical level? Yeah, well, of course, what this means uh, for Americans is the intention here is to help those people, right? Uh, people who, because of uh, circumstance, have got in, gotten into heavy medical debt of no fault of their own. Uh, it's going to help them get a loan easier uh, to buy a house or get a car, you know, because uh, credit scores can decide a person's economic well-being. But, you know, Evelyn, those are the pros, but let me talk a little bit about the cons here. Uh, not everyone who has medical debt got there because of health emergencies. Uh, there are people who accrued medical debt because of their own choices uh, through, you know, elective surgeries or whatever. Those people, for them, uh, this looks a lot to me like a bailout uh, because for these people, basically what the proposal is saying that uh, you can make uh, poor choices in life and you won't face uh, the full, full consequences. And this could potentially encourage bad behavior in, in these individuals particularly. Mm, right, always the pros and cons there. So now anything else that you have for us this morning? Yeah, sure. Uh, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare uh, said that half a million people, including many children here, were wrongly kicked out of Medicaid because of state system errors. There's 29 states involved in the problem. The CMS will meet with each of the 29 states in Washington, D.C. to implement a fix. And besides that, uh, Chinese e-commerce giant Xi'an is sending more low-priced clothing to its U.S. warehouses. Uh, this is according to exclusive data obtained by Reuters. Uh, Xi'an has been leaving U.S. buyers facing weeks of, uh, or more, in fact, to receive goods. Uh, the new move is a bid to speed up their delivery times. And this is because it seeks to compete with larger rivals like Walmart and Amazon. But, you know, Xi'an has come under intense U.S. scrutiny for alleged forced labor practices and uh, potentially inhumane conditions for its workers. The company was also accused of copyright infringement and, and related racketeering activities. Uh, but other than these two updates, Evelyn, that's all from me this morning. Well, thank you so much, Don, for keeping us up to date every morning, host of NTD Business. Thank you. We have some rapid fire coverage for you. Here are some of the latest headlines. Oakland authorities revealed the cause of death of Euphoria star Angus Cloud. The sheriff's office told local media he died from acute intoxication from the combined effects of methamphetamine, cocaine, fentanyl, and benzodiapine. He was 25. Veep star Matt Walsh is taking a break from his appearance on Dancing with the Stars. He wants to show solidarity with those involved in the months-long WGA strike. He told CBS News he thought the show wasn't prohibited by the strike and that as soon as he found out it was, he immediately walked out.
South Florida is now the site of America's first private intercity train system in a century. Florida train company Brightline will begin launching service between Miami and Orlando today and is expected to serve up to 8 million riders annually. A lawsuit filed against Starbucks accuses a company of false and deceptive practices that's in the marketing and sales of a number of its fruit refresher drinks. The suit alleges there is no actual mango, passion fruit, or acai in their refresher drinks. A private train firm. That is so interesting. I would like to ride it. Oh yeah, well, report back then. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Well, I mean, I've taken Amtrak, and of course that was created out of an act of Congress decades ago, and it's a nice line. Mm. But we'll have to see what Brightline's all about. Oh yeah, for sure. Coming up, the Federal Trade Commission will have to answer accusations in court that it withheld documents related to Elon Musk and Twitter. And we speak to an executive coach to get an idea of what makes a good solution-oriented leader and how the workplace can be a more fun and dynamic environment. I was vaccinated because I'm a carer. I've had all three and I have the flu one as well. As far as the government is concerned, I believe they are doing the best thing for the nation. I just thought it was better that I get it done. I wanted to protect other people. The COVID vaccine has been hailed as a medical and logistical success. It's claimed that millions of lives have been saved, but there's growing evidence that the jab can have devastating consequences. They actually told my wife and two children that they had no hope, and if I did survive, it would be from the waist up. You take one for the team, so I, I took the vaccine, but now the team's run in the opposite direction. Just to let people know that when it goes wrong, there's like no help at all. This vaccine is not completely safe and has unprecedented harms. There's always a searching process for beauty. You know it when you see it. Hey, I told you enough of that. But look, this is different. It's gone Jing World. Welcome back. The Federal Trade Commission is under fire, accused of illegally concealing documents that could prove partisan retaliation against Elon Musk and Twitter. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on the lawsuit by America First Legal. The House Committee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government issued a staff report in March concluding the FTC harassed Twitter after Elon Musk bought it. The report found that the FTC inappropriately stretched its regulatory power to harass Twitter and misused a consent decree, which deals with safeguarding user information, to justify its campaign of harassment for political reasons. Following the release of the report, America First Legal launched an investigation into the FTC and filed a federal ethics and inspector general complaints. The goal was to determine whether the agency engaged in partisan retaliation against Elon Musk and Twitter for exposing what it calls the Biden administration's collusive censorship. America First Legal claims that the FTC ignored the law and refused to search for or hand over the requested documents, calling that a violation of the Freedom of Information Act. America First Legal Vice President and General Counsel Gene Hamilton discussed the lawsuit, saying... Our woke, weaponized federal government will stop at nothing to harass and attempt to intimidate its perceived opponents. The American people have had enough. What they have done in the dark will be brought to the light. 
The FTC said in an emailed statement that it has no comment on AFL's lawsuit. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Next, we move to the topic of leadership and why in an organization it's better to make everyone a leader. That's right. I spoke to Dr. Rick Goodman, who is a keynote speaker, author, and executive coach. He explains why organizations should make solution-oriented leaders. Take a look. Why should an organization create a company f full of, or a whole culture full of solution-oriented leaders as opposed to just a few on the management level? Well, what we find is most people are standing around waiting to be told what to do. And what a solutions-oriented leader believes is that we don't develop other followers. That's not the goal. The, the goal is to develop other leaders. So what a transformational leader does is they give their team the vision, and then they give them the tools and the support to carry out and follow through with the vision. And when they do that, they then grow another set of leaders. So the goal is to not only have a whole company of leaders, but to constantly be evolving that leadership so people can make their own choices. And as we know, when anybody gets to make their own choices about their life, they make themselves feel much better about themselves. Right. Now, let's get into a bit more detail when it comes to that. So solutions-oriented leader may also sound like someone that gets, uh, you know, the answers, for example, for a solution and then delegates the task with specific action items. So on a practical level, how can a company create a culture that encourages everyone to have that kind of solution-oriented thinking then? Well, that's that's the idea, is to have everybody open to come up with those different solutions. And we use a concept uh, that I borrowed from a friend of mine called smart storming. And we used to brainstorm and people would throw up ideas and see if it sticks and some wouldn't work. And anytime a leader would say, well, you know what, I don't know if that idea will work. What it does is it shuts down that person's thinking. So we like to use the term what if. What if opens you to possibility thinking? What if this is gonna work? So if a leader opens themselves up to that possibility thinking, then they're gonna see the solutions. And I like to say it's kind of like the example of a helicopter. And when we look at a helicopter, there's three phases. And the first phase is all about me. We're all worried about ourselves. The second phase is we're kind of butting heads. And the third phase is we get up in the helicopter. So as an example, when they had the fires in Maui, the first thing everybody said is they need supplies, they need this stuff, and people were arguing. And then they threw all these supplies supplies at them, but nobody knew what to do with the supplies. And then they sent in a drone to get up and see where everybody needed supplies and distribution. If a leader can get up in that helicopter and get their team up in that helicopter so they can look down on the situation, that's where they really solve the solutions. It's not what's inside and what's happening right in front of their face. Mm. Now, talking about motivation, how will it impact that and quality of work? Well, any time that somebody comes up with an idea and that leader then lets everybody know that that was that person's idea, it lifts them up right away. And everybody wants what they can have. So now you have the rest of the team saying, hey, if that person can do it, I can do it too. Or I'd like to have that also. So it really stirs some sort of a competitive edge. And, and I, used to, I like to use gamification with my teams a lot because people like to play games. And if we create it so it's a game to hit the goal, everybody's having fun. Hmm. And when it comes to that kind of transformation, there is always, I hear people talking about that bell curve, and in the end there is this late majority in the laggards that people that just might give you obstacles. How do you get those on board? Well, you know, there's always, everybody has a superpower. So I want to find out what their highest and best use is. And what I found working with Fortune 100 companies around the world is a lot of times it's people that aren't in the right position that matches their personality style. And all of a sudden we move them over slightly and they flourish like a butterfly and they just spread their wings and fly. I think that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Rick Goodman. I really appreciated your advice today. Thank you so much for having me, Ellen. Sounds good. And gamification just sounds like it's always a good idea. Yeah, novel way to get people excited about leadership. Right. We're going to the break now. A young woman from Taiwan finds beauty in nature and in the creation of ancient Chinese calligraphy. We bring you more of her story in our latest report on the Miss NTD Beauty pageant coming up. Is deep sea fish oil really healthy? Due to pollution in the oceans, most fish contain heavy metal elements and radioactive substances. That's why it's so important to choose a pure source of omega-3. 
Curatang green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslane and perilla seeds, which are rich in nutrients and minerals, especially vitamins A, D, E, calcium and iron. With natural processing and no harmful chemical additives, it has more than 90% concentration of omegas 3, 6, 7 and 9. It effectively improves brain power and is beneficial to the heart's health. Puritang Omega-3 does not smell of fish and contains no pollutants, so both adults and children can safely and easily consume it over a long period of time. Puritang Green Vegetable Omega-3 – greener, healthier and more effective. Visit puritang.com to learn more. What if he gives you HPV? I chose to get vaccinated because I'll do everything I can to help protect myself from cervical cancer. It sounded very cool how oh, there can be a cure for cancer. She was just a normal 12-year-old girl. Hi! She always told me, Mama, I love my life. But she has been lying in bed for three years now. These are very large particles in these vaccines. There's a lot of aluminium associated with large particles. We were not informed about the use of aluminium. We have not found any evidence that these adjuvants have ever been tested for safety. It was both exciting and frightening to have a test where there was an answer, there is something that should not be in your blood, and, but you have it. Buying a house is complicated and confusing, especially now. That's why who you work with matters. Together with Homelight, we find solutions for every buyer. Our team helps you get the home you love every time. You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Welcome back. Ancient calligraphy inspires beauty. A young woman from Taiwan says artistic creation elevates her mind and heart. Annie Lee is one of the 40 finalists of the Entity International Chinese Beauty Pageant. She also believes the beauty of women is in harmony with the beauty of nature. Here's her story. I studied traditional Chinese art in both my undergraduate and graduate programs, taking courses like calligraphy, traditional Chinese painting, seal carving, Nihonga, and Chinese art theory. After being exposed to traditional Chinese culture, it has changed me in a subliminal way. I learned that the ancient artists not only pursued technical improvement of their craft, but also placed great emphasis on inner cultivation and moral conduct. It could even be said that they prioritized this aspect above all else. During my time in college, I had several experiences of selling handwritten Chinese New Year couplets at the morning market. Every time I sold couplets, I felt that the customers received the goodwill and blessings I imparted through them. I also sensed that my patrons believed that handwritten Chinese New Year couplets indeed held value, and the traditional meaning within them carried a warmth. I feel that in order to achieve a breakthrough in my skill, aside from putting in hard work, I need to simultaneously improve myself from within. Seal carving requires precise layout within a miniature surface. The use of the carving knife demands caution and accuracy, and each character needs to be meticulously engraved multiple times to take shape. It involves the patience akin to turning an iron rod into a needle and the persistence of water dripping through stone. I believe these principles also reflect a way of life. I have come to realize that these values are deeply embedded in traditional Chinese culture and it has profound meaning. I believe that artistic creation can indeed reflect a person's inner qualities, just as one's outer appearance can reflect their inner self. 
If your inner state is tranquil, then your artworks will likely convey a soothing feeling. If you are humble and sincere, then your writing can impart a sense of dignity and stability to others. Ancient people often used elements from the natural world to metaphorically describe women, such as plum blossoms, hibiscus flowers, the moon, and jade. The purity of lotus, the nobility of bamboo, the virtue of water carrying all things, and so on. All these beautiful qualities found in nature's myriad creations, I believe, are bestowed by the divine and meant to inspire humanity. I consider the beauty of women to be in harmony with the beauty of all things in nature. My family expressed their gratitude towards NTD for organizing this beauty pageant, which emphasized the principles of morality, righteousness, propriety, benevolence, and faithfulness as its foundation. To have returning to tradition as an evaluation criterion is unprecedented. I believe that the contestants participating in this pageant will showcase the diverse facets of female beauty and together with everyone, learn and explore what traditional beauty truly means. I consider it a great honor to be part of this journey. The finals and coronation of the Miss NTD pageant are coming next Saturday. For tickets and more about the event, go to MissNTD.com. That's right, and we have hit 8 a.m., which means we're heading into the second part of our broadcast now. Yes, stay with us for some more coverage coming up, including some interesting interviews about mules at the border, and they're not animals, so stay with us. In yesterday's trip to Washington, Ukrainian President Zelensky was met with mixed receptions. We have reactions to his visit. Drug smuggling across the border has become a major problem. We look at a recruitment tool that drug cartels are using. A new study says one of Mexico's largest employers is the drug business, but they're not talking about pharmaceuticals. We have the details. We take another look at the proposed strike action by the United Auto Workers Union and its likely impacts on the industry and economy. AI technology is becoming a larger part of our lives daily. See what YouTube is rolling out for users of its platform. Welcome back to NTD Good Morning. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning from me as well again. I'm Evelyn Lee. We're heading to our top news. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was met with a mixed reception during his visit to Washington yesterday. He spoke with President Biden at the White House, military leaders at the Pentagon, and lawmakers on Capitol Hill. Zelensky is in Canada today on a surprise visit. He arrived in Ottawa last night. He's set to address the Canadian Parliament this morning and continue his efforts to shore up support. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on Zelensky's visit and lawmakers' reactions. President Biden announced a new military aid package for Ukraine worth $325 million on Zelensky's Thursday visit and vowed continued U.S. support. And next week, the first U.S. Abrams tanks will be delivered to Ukraine. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the presidential drawdown assistance package includes significant air defense capabilities, but that the U.S. will not be providing long-range Army tactical missile systems that Zelensky is requesting, at least for now. These capabilities will help Ukraine harden its defenses ahead of what is likely to be a tough winter. The U.S. has appropriated $113 billion in military, economic, and humanitarian aid to Ukraine and countries affected by the war since it began. Sullivan says those funds will soon run dry and is asking Congress for additional resources on October 1st. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy called his meeting with Zelensky direct and productive. We're very concerned about accountability. Biden has asked Congress for more than $24 billion for Ukraine support. McCarthy says he's willing to look at it, but thinks more of the president's focus should be on the southern border. Right now, the CR we have does not have that. We also have a lot of disasters in America. Senator Josh Hawley says his position on Ukraine remains the same. Let's not forget, Russia is a problem for us, but China is our number one foreign policy threat. Number one. The Pentagon says Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin provided Zelensky an update on security assistance during his visit and reaffirmed support. We're going to continue to work very hard with Ukraine and our international allies and partners 
to ensure they have what they need to be successful on the battlefield. Zelensky thanked the U.S. for its military assistance and support at his speech at the National Archives. There is not a soul in Ukraine that does not feel gratitude to you, America, to you, the people who help us, not because, because you have to, but because your heart cannot let you do otherwise. The Ukrainian leader says America's investment in Ukraine is security and global protection of freedom. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The Biden administration is facing backlash as a recent surge in illegal immigrants floods into border towns. NTD's Daniel Monahan brings us more on the worsening crisis. Thousands of illegal immigrants have crossed into the United States in recent days, and more are still arriving by bus and cargo train to Mexican border towns. The administration had promised to carry out harsh penalties for illegal crossers in May, but experts say the U.S. lacks the capacity to detain and process them. As a result, some are being released into the U.S. with a future court date instead of being deported. One of the worst hit towns is Eagle Pass, Texas. The border town announced a state of emergency on Wednesday. This after nearly 6,000 illegal immigrants crossed the Rio Grande River in two days. Southern states aren't in the quagmire alone. Cities like New York and Chicago are also grappling with record numbers of new arrivals. The Windy City recently awarded a private security company a contract worth $30 million. The task? Moving the migrants out of police stations and airports into giant tents in two winterized camps before the winter freeze arrives. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Fentanyl smuggling. Who are the pawns in this illicit act? U.S. citizens and Mexican nationals with permanent U.S. residency are often those charged with bringing drugs across the border. These couriers are often desperate for the money and take up the task despite a possible 5 to 20 year prison sentence. We bring in an accomplished border officer to tell us more about this. Joining me now is Victor Avila, a retired special agent with Homeland Security Investigations ICE. Victor, thank you so much for your time today. This is such an important topic here. It certainly is. Can you walk us through how these organized criminals are approaching these mules, these people that they recruit in order to get their drugs across the border? Well, I'll tell you this. It ha definitely has evolved in the last uh, five to ten years, uh, and uh, technology has a lot to do with it. We're talking about social media and um, technology over the phone. There's a lot of recruitment going on over the internet, uh, over these apps, over social media, Instagram, Snapchat, because the cartels will use anyone that is willing to come and transport those drugs for them. Uh, in my career, I saw a, a wide spectrum of what we call mules, uh, 70, 80 year old men and women versus teenagers. Um, and it's continuing to happen even more so now. I do see a trend of using younger people, high school students, that can drive loads of not just drugs, but human beings from the border to stash houses and further into the U.S. and also obviously smuggle the drugs into, uh, in, between, uh, in between the ports of entry and at the ports of entry as well. CBP officials, they, some of them have been in this job for 36 years. They're saying that this practice has been going on for a long time now. Have there been any improvements in the way that border officials address this problem? That's a great question because we've seen the involvement of the cartels and the shifting that they've done. And I frankly have not seen it uh, uh, be done at the U.S. law enforcement side. And I'm talking about CBP. Uh, Office of Field Operations, the U.S. Customs in Blue, where you see at the ports of entry, and the land, the land ports, where I think we need to change our mission statement of how we uh, admit people into the country. You know, millions of people and vehicles come through those ports of entry on a daily basis, but we must now change that approach because we are uh, allowing a lot of drugs to come into this country. You know, there's percentages out there that we're probably grabbing 10 to 15% of the actual illicit drugs that are coming into this country because it's a lot easier to transport fentanyl pills and than it is to a brick of cocaine or marijuana. Uh, it's easier to conceal, it's easier to put in any, in any place imaginable. And if you can think of it, the cartel has and they continue to smuggle it in that way. And these can be put in the cars, even inside people's bodies, making it very hard to detect. So what procedures can they go through to try to screen this out? 
Well, I, I think it's the uh, the vetting, right? I mean, the, these uh, officers are under a tremendous amount of pressure. Uh, sometimes they have uh, 30 seconds to a minute just to, uh, as a person approaches the, the primary inspection booth. And it, it's very diligent. Uh, sometimes we have to make sacrifices here to make uh, make additional time for our officers to make a better determination of whether that individual is bringing in illicit substances or not. Canines, um, we have the training facility in El Paso, Texas, but we have one dog or two dogs. I want to see a hundred dogs on the port of entry. I want to see the millions of dollars be poured into the training of more canines because canines can only work a certain amount of time, 20 minutes, uh, uh, and have to take off, especially with the heat and all these conditions. Well, I want to train more dogs. I want to spend the money and those resources to where they're walking the line up and down, detecting drugs left and right. Instead of having one dog that's exhausted and tired, uh, I want to see 50 uh, dogs per uh, port of entry. That's where I want to see our tax dollars be used. Certainly, border officials definitely have their hands full. A great update from you, Victor Avila, retired special agent with HSI ICE. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, so on that note, are you looking for a high-stress job that may be fatal? A new study published in the journal Science this week says drug cartels are the fifth largest employer in Mexico. That's right. The study authors used statistics to wrap their head around how many people work in the criminal organizations, facts like the number of homicides when cartels turn on each other, the number of missing persons, as well as the number of arrests and those incarcerated. They then put the data into their math model to figure out what kind of recruitment cartels would need per week to replace their losses. Their model demonstrates the number of members in Mexico's 150 cartels increased from around 115,000 to about 175,000 over 10 years. And if those numbers are correct, that would make cartels Mexico's fifth biggest employer. Well, it just the only thing missing seems like the study didn't cite any info about a possible 401k plan. Well, but moving on now, New York officials are probing the cause of a bus crash that killed two adults and injured dozens of students yesterday. At least five children were in critical condition as of last night. The bus was carrying 40 high school band members and four adults. It was one of six in a convoy heading to a band camp in Pennsylvania and ran off the highway and tumbled down a steep ravine. The National Transportation Safety Board and New York State Police are investigating. A team is expected to arrive at the scene of the crash this morning. That's on Interstate 84 near the town of Bovoyanda, about 70 miles northwest of New York City. The school district says the other five buses turned back after the crash and offered students the chance to meet with grief counselors on the way home. And heading into break now, the United Auto Workers deadline to avoid extended strike action is today. We take a look at what this means for the industry and economy and for workers. And it's being called the end of an era. Rupert Murdoch is retiring as Fox News chairman. We take a look at a mom who gets some unexpected help to finish a race. Those stories and more coming up. More than 10,000 Falun Gong practitioners protested peacefully in Beijing, China. In what amounts to the largest demonstration since the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. Falun Gong is like shan. Learn the people. 不是越多越好吗？如果人们都去信法轮功了，谁还信共产党呢？It is literally life and death for many party members to not let the story be told. That the government is conducting one of the largest scale propaganda campaigns in history. You just want to wait for it. 你怎么消息啊？ People are being hurt. They're being killed. They're being jailed. If we don't act, sometimes you have to compromise things you believe in to protect yourself. They are some of the hottest videos on social media. Those videos claiming to instantly get rid of bags under your eyes. Annette Figueroa is here to tell us why she says this one is for real. 
This one is for real, and I'm so excited. Not only does it work on the bags, it works on the appearance of crow's feet, fine lines, and wrinkles. We even have a video, and all he uses is a small amount, and that's how easy it is. And I did this to my father. We were at home. Four minutes, 34 seconds, completely gone. My real true opinion is holy words I can't say on camera. <laughs> This is absolutely unbelievable. I mean, I could feel it just lifting my skin. It was amazing. It feels good. It feels great. Looks even better. At our $14.95 price, it's the best way to try Plexiderm and see it work for yourself after your first application. Your solution is at PlexidermTrial.com or call the number on your screen. It's good to have you back with us. Members of the United Auto Workers Union rallied against Detroit's big three automakers in multiple states yesterday. UAW President Sean Fain has threatened automakers with extended action after today's deadline unless demands are met. NTD's Cost Temenas has more on the rally and what extended strike action could mean for automakers and the economy. The standoff comes as the UAW last week launched simultaneous and unprecedented strikes. At one assembly plant of each of the big three automakers, General Motors, Ford and Chrysler parent Stellantis. The seven-day standoff will likely disrupt production and ripple through the supply chain. Prolonged action could also affect economic growth. More than 12,500 workers are on strike out of the nearly 150,000 UAW union members working at the Big Three. Workers are demanding an end to a tiered wage structure, a 40% pay increase and better benefits. Amid what they described as record profits by the companies. UAW President Sean Fain has threatened automakers with extended action by today's deadline, unless demands are met. The three automakers have proposed 20% raises over four and a half years. GM President Mark Royce has rejected claims that company profits go toward fueling corporate greed, saying the funds have instead been reinvested in electric vehicles as well as gasoline-powered cars. The Biden administration has shown support for the strikes, saying strike action should go further until demands are met. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott has come under fire for criticizing the strike, saying striking workers should be fired, prompting a complaint filed against him by the UAW's leader. According to SNP, the strikes are likely to last several weeks. The impact of the strikes on the supply chain would initially be modest, but could escalate if the action continues. Cost MNS, NTD News. A report by the Heritage Foundation found the government added $7.5 trillion to the national debt over the last two years, contributing to inflation. The author of the report shares the main takeaways and what the government can do to fix the problem. Richard Stern, director, of the, her, uh, director at the Heritage Foundation, joins us now. Thank you so much for your time, Richard. What are the main takeaways of this report here? Well, thank you for having me on today. I think the main takeaway of this report is that the government wantonly just added trillion after trillion dollars of spending, amounting to seven and a half trillion dollars of needless spending during a two year period of time. And how was almost all of that money paid for? With the Federal Reserve just printing the money. And that is like pouring water into the wine of everyone's life savings. That drove the inflation. It's driving the interest rate uh, uh, crunch now so that mortgages are unaffordable and that home ownership is a distant dream for most Americans. This is the main cause of that problem. We're seeing a slower, worse recovery because of the choices the government made during the pandemic, which had almost no effect on the economy during the pandemic. For better or for worse, those programs were in, in the works. So what is the solution to the economic damage that you attribute to this spending? Absolutely. The solution is to cut government spending. You know, at the end of the day, and like I said, it's real hardworking Americans that actually produce all of the goods and services we have. When the government goes in the debt, when it prints money, what it's doing is putting artificial demand. What I mean is it's creating demand for goods and services without having produced any goods and services whatsoever. My, my joke is there's only two people that can get money without producing value for somebody else and it's criminals and the federal government. So as long as the government is willing to spend so much money and run such large deficits that it'll drive this inflation, 
there is no way out from under it. The Fed can move it between an interest rate crisis and an inflation crisis, but you can't get rid of it. There's only one solution to cut government spending. A lot of debate out of this, and thank you for working so hard on that 46-page report, 175 references. Richard Stern, the director of the Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget at the Heritage Foundation, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Unpaid medical bills could soon be wiped from credit reports. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is considering a proposal that would bar credit companies from putting that type of debt to un Americans' credit reports. The Bureau says medical bills are often mistakes due to issues with insurance and coverage and should not impact credit scores or the ability to receive a loan. The agency is asking small businesses that might be affected by the rule for input before it's proposed next year. And undercover journalism group Project Veritas is facing major financial troubles. This follows the departure of its founder, James O'Keefe. On Wednesday, Project Veritas CEO Hannah Geil said they will be making organizational changes, including laying off more employees due to, quote, various events and circumstances. The statement said Project Veritas is continuing to operate, but it's pausing its fundraising efforts. The group's founder and former CEO, James O'Keefe, was ousted by the board in February. Project Veritas has since faced a drop in donations. O'Keefe is now heading O'Keefe Media Group and continues to carry out undercover investigations similar to what Project Veritas is doing. And speaking of journalism, media mogul Rupert Murdoch is stepping down as the chairman of Fox News, ending a decades-long career. Here's the story. Rupert Murdoch has stepped down as chairman of Fox and News Corp, ending a more than seven-decade career. During that time, the 92-year-old created a media empire spanning from Australia to the United States. His son, Lachlan Murdoch, will become the sole chairman of News Corp and continue as the chair and CEO of Fox, the company said on Thursday. Former News Corp digital CEO John Miller calls this the end of an era. I think Rupert may just be uh, about the last of the founder moguls in the media business. And you think about people like Ted Turner, uh, in, in that regard, for example, Sumner Redstone and now Rupert Murdoch and maybe a nod to John Malone, who's still at it. But but uh, the, the kind of high profile media mogul, I think, was exemplified by the group I just mentioned. And, and Rupert is, is the remaining stalwart there. The transition solidifies Lachlan's role as the leader of the media empire, putting to rest questions of succession within the Murdoch family. What many people want to see is is how Lachlan will lead on his own. Um, and I think the expectation is that he'll be a, a businessman who is oriented towards some of the things that uh, uh, you could you see in place already. And I think he'll try to recraft uh, a, a larger enterprise. Lachlan will take over just months after his father scrapped a plan that would have reunited the media empire by merging Fox and News Corp. Murdoch, who is near controlling stakes in both companies, will be appointed chairman emeritus of both companies. In a memo to staff Thursday, he wrote, Our companies are in robust health, as am I. YouTube is the latest company to roll out generative AI technology for its user base. The company has unveiled several new AI tools to help make content creation easier and draw more people to its platform. One feature called Dream Screen lets creators add AI-generated video or image backgrounds to YouTube Shorts. Once you type in a prompt, AI does the rest. They will also offer an AI tool which allows creators to make videos in different languages. Some tools are only being offered to select creators, but next year YouTube plans on making them more vi widely available. Now we're heading to some uplifting news. A mother is making sure young adults battling cancer are granted their wishes. Kelly Bowley was by the side of her teenage son, Nick, as he lost his battle with cancer. During his treatment, the one thing that uplifted him was his make-a-wish trip to Hawaii. But Nick was devastated to find out that older children can't take part in make-a-wish. Nick's final request to his mom was for her to make sure that older kids can still get their wishes. So Kelly founded Nick's wish for those aged 18 to 24 fighting with cancer. Since then, she has surprised over 300 young adults with bucket list dreams. For Kelly, this means bringing a little joy into their lives, one wish at a time. 
So glad that people could benefit from Nick's wish. Yeah, absolutely. And in Utah, a marathon running mom got a little help from an unexpected running mate. Courtney Rich found herself struggling to complete the final mile of a race, but she got a little helping hand from her 10-year-old daughter, Avery, who jumped into the race to help her down the final stretch. Courtney said that her daughter's kind and warm-hearted gesture made all the pain just disappear. The pair then crossed the finish line hand in hand. Such great support. What a great mother-daughter duo. Yeah, a little helping hand can go a long way. Exactly. All right. It looks like that's all for today's program. And we would love to hear from you as, as usual. You can write us at goodmorning at ntd.com to write us your feedback. Shoot us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.